And welcome back to the Wellness Paradox Podcast. I'm so grateful that you can join us on this journey towards greater human flourishing. As always, I'm your host, Michael Stack, an exercise physiologist by training and a health entrepreneur and a health educator by trade. And I'm fascinated by a phenomena I call the wellness paradox. This paradox, as I view it, is the trust, interaction, and communication gap that exists between fitness professionals and our medical community. This podcast is all about closing off that gap by disseminating the latest, most evidence-based, and most engaging information in the health sciences. And to do that in episode 56, we're joined by Miriam Zyburgate. She's a physician that works with a broad spectrum of patients, all from you know very young age to the geriatric population. And she's also a board-certified obesity medicine physician. But this is not a conversation necessarily around her medical practice. This is a conversation around the importance of well-being and not necessarily the well-being of our clients, but more so our own well-being. And as we'll talk about with Dr. Z in the podcast, we as caregivers tend to develop this high level of compassion fatigue, and we tend to put our own needs on the back burner. And this is really a conversation about the importance of putting your own oxygen mask on first before assisting others in your life. Uh, As Dr. Z will talk about, she, like many of us, had an epiphany during COVID and actually pivoted parts of her professional career to move towards addressing well-being broadly, uh, but certainly in the helping professions. Any additional information we'd like to share from today's episode can be found on the show notes page by going to Wellness Paradox Pod dot com forward slash episode five, six. Please enjoy this conversation with Dr. Z. Uh, Dr. Z, we're so delighted to be joined by you today. Thank you. (laughs) So we're going we're gonna to start our discussion out uh, just with a, a little bit of context for our audience. Uh, talk to us a little bit about your, your background, where, where you've been at, and now kind of where you're going. So first of all, thank you for having me. Um, I am originally from Peru, so that's the reason of my accent. I am a Latin girl. Uh, I went to medical school there, and I worked for almost 10 years for the Navy of my country as a physician. And then I met the love of my life, and that's the reason why I traveled from Lima, Peru to the U.S., Miami, U.S., uh, to start from zero. Uh, Here I had to do internship and residency and my fellowship again. Um, I was there, an internal medicine geriatrician, uh, so I did exactly the same here, just in case there's any doubt. I love what I do. Um, And in the process, I got pregnant uh, with my first and my second uh, boy. Uh, so that's kind of how I came here and where I am from. Uh, currently, I am in the process of transforming myself. Um, uh, I believe that COVID uh, showed me and many of us uh, that priorities not are always, uh, you know, constant and that we need to adapt our lives uh, when we are growing up. <laughs> Uh, and I am in the process of adapting myself, adapting my career, and, and trying to find who I am uh, and how I can be the best version of myself, the best mother, the best doctor, the best daughter, wife, etc. Uh, and through that process, uh, I am also writing a book about founding well-being and, 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 and trying to achieve the best version of yourself. Yeah, that's great. That COVID was such an inflection point for so many people and caused us to really question you know, what we were doing and where we want to be going. Talk to us a little bit about your, your medical background, because I, I think that that's somewhat pertinent to this discussion, just, just given our audience or our fitness professionals, they're probably working with a, a similar population to what you've worked with. So I am lucky to have 
the, the complete version of medicine in some way. I, as an internist, I see the young population, so I have the access to those that are not yet sick or they didn't develop any medical condition and I can do a lot of prevention. But in my geriatric uh, role, I, I see the opposite. I see already those that had the diseases and that maybe had already disability and etc. Uh, and at that point I am treating them or trying to offer them quality of life. Mm -hmm. And in between I decided, in between of COVID, during COVID, I decided to get a, an extra specialty, uh, which is obesity medicine, because I feel like something that both sides uh, have in common is uh, metabolic conditions, obesity, uh, inappropriate lifestyles. And if we use them for prevention, they will be great and will have a long-term effect. But even when we use them in this older population can have a positive effect to reduce falls, reduce other medical conditions, and, and again, make life uh, to be of more, more quality, which is at, at the end our, our goal, right? Yeah, and I feel like I can ask a million questions about your medical practice, but that, that's not what this conversation is about. <laughs> uh, you know, my, my team my team found you on LinkedIn and kind of on your well-being journey, and that's what our discussion's going to be around today is, you know, broadly this concept of well-being, and then we'll make it a little bit more specific to, you know, the professionals that, that are truly caregivers, like in your field, as we get towards the end. But you know, this is obviously something you became intensely interested in, so much so that you're kind of you know creating a second career for yourself, writing a book on this. Uh, what? Why is it so important for us to zoom out from terms that are narrow, like health and fitness, and talk talk more broadly about well-being? Because I believe that we, as professionals, as caregivers, we have been suffering of this altruist syndrome where we focus uh, in helping others so much that we forget about ourselves. And I, I am a victim of the same altruistic syndrome. I have to admit that. And I have been for several years, decades at this point. But what you discover is that at some point when the stress levels go, you know, high, you don't have enough you know inside of you to deal with that extra stress and i feel like covid was a great way to show all of us right just adding an extra drop in our cups that okay we were in our own limits we we were surviving uh and and that's not the type of life that I want for myself, not the type of life that I want for my kids or my family and for anybody else. That, that's not life. Surviving is not life. So I decided to start learning more about well-being, uh, advocacy, uh, diversity and inclusion during these last two years. Uh, because also I saw things happening, you know, that when, when we are in our limits, uh, in our limits and our thresholds, what happens is also compassion fatigue. You don't have the energy to take care of others anymore and to fake being kind, right? Uh, again, you, you are surviving. Um, and that's when you see realities. And the reality is that in the world that we live, uh, there is a lot of disparity, there is a lot of discrimination, there is a lot of lack of clear priorities. Uh, and I decided that if I want to show a different way, I need to learn first. Because one thing is to have good intentions and another is to have the knowledge uh, and the understanding of what you are trying to do. Yeah, absolutely. It, it is. It's, it's very interesting. It is, as you said, compassion fatigue. It's you, you, you give and you give and you give. And eventually, even the most passionate person kind of runs out of, of things to give. When, when you look at your profession, because I'm curious as a, as a medical professional, what you feel like you've seen over these past couple of years, uh, you know, just kind of give, give our audience a look under the hood of what medical professionals have dealt with. Cause I, I think it's, it's, you hear about it, but it's something else to hear about it directly from somebody. So what is, what has this period been like? So I need to confess that I was not 
inside of the hospital. My job is as an outpatient uh, physician. So truly uh, what happened inside of doors uh, is more what I what I know is what I heard from my friends, from my residents, mm -hmm. uh, and it was not good. Um, the amount of suffering that were they were exposed to, the amount of injustice, the frustration, the lack of supplies, the difficult decisions that they needed to take when we didn't have yet vaccines, we didn't know about really how to treat those patients, we didn't have enough ventilators or masks, they were uh, beyond what we were trained as physicians and beyond what we are expected as human beings, right? Nobody prepares you for something like that. Um, there is a term that is called vicarious stress or vicarious trauma. Uh, it's not necessarily very well known, but it's the version of post-traumatic stress that happens not when something traumatic happen directly to you, but when you are the witness of something traumatic, very typically in caregivers, right? So this secondary or, or, or vicarious traumatic stress is something that is affecting a lot of physicians today and a lot of um, healthcare, you know, workers in general, uh, and that we need to focus on because right now we have, um, and I, I will use the term uh, very loosely, but disabled, right, uh, caregivers or healthcare workers dealing with death and, and, and difficult conditions daily basis without being able to receive any, any help. Yeah, yeah. And, and again, the reason I, I kind of wanted you to paint that picture is because this just speaks to the, the greater importance of the concept of well-being now more than it ever has. So you, you've started to research this to, to write this book. I'm curious to dive in a little bit to, you know, what, what, are, you, what are you learning? Kind of, kind of teach on this concept a little bit. I'm sure you're learning a lot. Hello. So, so, I mean, just, just start to talk about some of the things that you feel are, are most important for our audience to know. I believe that the first thing that I learned um, is to ask for help. And, and the importance of having connections with others. Mm -hmm. Because asking for help requires a lot of effort instead of weakness. And it's something that, especially physicians, we are not used to, right? Ask for help or show vulnerability. Yeah. So I learned the power of vulnerability. When you are aware of your weakness, when you are aware of your gaps, where you are aware of your needs, you will have the ability of going the next step, which is asking for help or helping yourself mm -hmm. or learning, right? And then your journey of recovery starts. So the first thing that I will suggest to anybody that may be going through a difficult situation uh, is go inside of yourself and, and, and find out what's exactly happening to you. What are the feelings? Are you suffering? Are you on fear? Uh, what do you need and who can offer that help to you? And you will be surprised that there are many, many, many individuals around going through the same or similar situations and many others ready to help. So as for help, uh, I believe that that's lesson number one and, and probably the most painful because uh, you really, uh, as I say, you are almost uh, getting emotionally naked in front of others and, yeah. and, and that's very difficult. Beyond that, I learned many lessons about the importance of being self-compassionate, right? Respecting yourself, creating boundaries, uh, something that majority of us, we don't do again in this altruistic lifestyle where we are the yes person, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, 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 yes. Still is your time to get your checkup or take your pills or mm -hmm. whatever you need. And, and, and for that one, you don't have a yes ready. So uh, take care of yourself uh, because there is nothing that you can offer to others if you are not okay. Uh, and that's something that you will reflect even if you don't like, right? You will go and you will be stressed without sleeping, hungry, 
uh, sad, uh, sick, and you will not be performing appropriately. Uh, and that will be noticed in, in the results. So, so be careful of taking care of yourself. Again, something that I, I personally need to, <laughs> to learn too. It's part of my, my journey. Um, and the other thing that I learned also is uh, that you can go beyond your fears, you can go beyond your limitations, you can go beyond adversity. That adversity is something that really is an opportunity to grow. Mm. Uh, this uh, concept that in, in positive psychology is called PTG, post-traumatic growth, mm -hmm. uh, is something that I am using actually as, as the baseline of, of, of my book, uh, where I present different experiences of real people, real individuals that went through really traumatic events or, or, or medical conditions or situations that were very difficult, challenging. And they were able to, as I say, use lemons and make lemonade and even a delicious lemon pie at the end, uh, which is the opportunity for us to improve, to grow. We decide why what we do with our life. Uh, and I, I hate this idea of being a victim. Uh, life has not been easy for me, the same that has not been easy for anybody else I know. And, and this is a question of perspective. What hurts you? What bothers you, right? Mm -hmm. What is trauma? It depends on how we feel it. Nobody can you know, replicate that or, or judge that. But what is true is that we decide what we do with our present and our future. We cannot change the past, but we can empower ourselves to, as I say in my book, be the writer of your story, yeah. be the editor, and be the principal actor. And uh, that's what I want to tell everybody in the book, that to stop being victims, and to take the responsibility because when you remove yourself from the victim position, right, you have the opportunity to take decisions and to be the one that runs the show, but that comes with responsibility. You need to be responsible of the decisions that you take and the way that you live your life. I'd like to take a quick break from today's episode to tell you more about one of our sponsors. As all of you are well aware, the COVID-19 pandemic has been absolutely devastating for the fitness industry, with upwards of one third of our clubs closing nationally on a permanent basis. One of the few stabilizing forces during this very tumultuous period of time has been URSA, the Global Trade Association for the Health and Fitness Industry. On my crusade to make fitness professionals part of our healthcare continuum, the work that URSA is doing is absolutely vital. They provide advocacy and lobbying support at both the federal and the state level. They support state alliances in many ways, and they also provide resources and best practices to club owners, operators, and individual fitness professionals. Indeed, if we are truly going to become part of the healthcare continuum, we must speak with one unified voice. We must have best practices that we implement and we must come together as an industry to ensure the public, the medical community, and lawmakers hear our message loud and clear that movement is medicine and it is essential. That is the work that URSA is doing. They've recently revamped their membership structure, allowing large clubs, small clubs, boutiques, and individual professionals to join the organization for an appropriate price that allows them to have access to all of these many great resources and allows us to unify and amplify our voice as an industry. For more information on the amazing work that URSA is doing, go to their website, ursa.org. That's I-H-R-S-A dot org. I-H-R-S-A dot org to look in a little bit further into the work URSA is doing to unify our industry, to move us closer to being a part of that healthcare continuum. Now back to today's episode. Yeah, I, those are fascinating lessons. And I think you know, something that all of us really need to hear right now. With 
this perspective on, on well-being and being a physician, because you're, you're writing this book and you're still a practicing physician. So you, you, you wear in a couple different hats. How do you envision this changing or, or altering your practice as a physician? Because it's not lost on me that, yes, you want to make people healthier, but ascending to a level of wellness or well-being is kind of a, a more overarching goal. So ha- have you thought about that at all and as to how it's going to influence your practice? I believe that the book in some way is a result of my experience as a physician. Uh, in geriatrics, we learn medicine in a different way. We have this idea of the holistic approach that many other specialties will not necessarily pay too much attention. Um, and when you think about holistic approach, we are talking about the individual being part of his real life or her real life, mm-hmm. right? We are not talking about the kidney or the liver or the brain. We are talking about a person, a human being, a mother, a father, a daughter uh, that is confronting real situations every day. Uh, and that may be uh, the loss of someone that she loves and then therefore she's depressed, maybe a disability, maybe lack of job because COVID came and you know, the economy is is not good right now and many other things. So when you see a patient and you only try to focus in the high blood pressure, you are missing a big part of information. Therefore, a lot of opportunities to really create a positive impact in his general life and in his health too. You cannot ask someone that doesn't have insurance to get a fancy medication, Mm -hmm. right? Uh, Because it will be impossible and to eat super healthy because salads are more expensive than any fast food, right? Mm -hmm. And to exercise because that person is working two or three shifts just trying to get money to fit her kids or his kids. So uh, we need to understand that this specific person that is in front of us has a specific needs. And we as physicians, we need to adapt to those needs. They don't need to adapt to us. Um, and I believe that that vision changed tremendously the relationship that, that you create with your patient because now it's a close relationship where you know who is your patient beyond the kidney and the blood test and where you create a connection of trust, right? And teamwork, uh, because your patient needs to actively participate in in his, her care, right? Uh, With your support, but they need, they are by themselves 364 days extras, right? Uh, A few minutes only with you. So what happened the other days? That's why you include them. And again, that's a concept of well-being, well-being, which is different than wellness because wellness is more just related to health. But well-being is a, it's a broader concept that involves the psychological, emotional, uh, financial uh, aspects, right, of, of your life, of course, the physical too. So if you want to get well-being, that's what we healthcare workers need to offer, right? This holistic vision of what is medicine in general. Yeah, it's so true. It, it is it is about treating the whole person. And we've had, you know, on the podcast before, we've had people from the American College of Lifestyle Medicine on, David Katz, Kate Collins, and, you know, they, they talk specifically about this concept of, of whole person. And it's encouraging to hear that medicine broadly is, is going in that perspective. I'm curious, do, do you feel that, that this is an isolated trend amongst a few people in the medical community, do you feel like the larger medical community is starting to embrace the concept of of the whole person? I'm curious your perspective on that. I see, I see the, the, the sigh and and the look out of your face. I'm curious (laughs) curious what your thoughts are. I'm trying to, I'm trying to to answer this in a very polite way. (laughs) I have mixed feelings. I believe that majority of us physicians and healthcare workers in general, we go to medicine uh, to the practice of, of healthcare with good intentions and trying to help, uh, and that we really are 
committed to service. Uh, I want to start with that, that I believe that that's the truth. I have to also say that this the medicine has been become uh, became a, a business right now. And um, if you are expected to see patients in 15 minutes, there's not too much of holistic that will fit that, <laughs> that time frame. So I feel that many physicians, we are suffering because of how the system has been uh, transformed uh, in something that appreciates volume, mm -hmm. appreciates budgets and metrics and not human beings. Um, and the big problem with that, beyond the fact that you cannot do this holistic approach that per se is affecting patients, no doubt, right? And the healthcare system per se, because that means that a high blood pressure that was able to be easily controlled now is a stroke that is admitted in the hospital that requires a lot of, you know, tests. And then also that person becomes disabled, so now goes to a nursing home or a facility for rehab and now is not able to go back to their regular job and will depend from the state to survive, right? And that will affect the complete family. So, so a 15 minutes versus 30 could be a completely different story at the end. Just to clarify how, how big this is and how our taxes are affected by that and how the complete system is affected by this, right? Uh, this is the complete vision. But beyond that, uh, you need to understand that for those that went to medical, the medical field, right, expecting to help people, the fact that we feel frustrated, that we are not able to do our job in the way that we want to, that we cannot create an appropriate connection with our patients, that we feel that we are just robots, right? Mm -hmm is removing from our brains, our hearts, our souls, what I call vita vitamins for my soul, that is mm. what makes me happy. What makes me happy during all these long days, sometimes 30 hours of work, right? Mm. It's like I helped someone, someone gave me a smile or a hug, someone is feeling better. That second that you are receiving this positive feedback, right? Uh, really give you all the energy that you need to continue. Yeah. And in those 15 minutes, how many of these opportunities we are missing? And uh, if you ask me the reason for burnout, and, and if you ask many doctors, they will not answer a lot of hours, a lot of work, because we were doing that already several decades ago is the lack of human connection, is the lack of meaningful work, is the lack of respect that we receive from the system that doesn't trust enough on us and our ability to take the decision of how much time a patient needs. Yeah. And that's painful. Yeah, it's it's so it's fascinating to hear you say that. And yeah, I, that's my experience as well, is that doctors and people in allied health get into the profession to help, but it is a business and it's a business that values, you know, numbers and bottom line. And it's hard to make that change from the bottom up level. Uh, you know, that, that is, that is a top down type of problem that is certainly far beyond the reaches of this conversation <laughs> this morning that we're having, but yeah, I appreciate that insight. And, you know, for, for the majority of our audience who are, you know, fitness and wellness professionals, I think this gives you a, a good look under the hood of you know, what happens in medicine, because I think, you know, we sometimes in our profession, we don't understand the perspective that medical professionals have. And, you know, hearing you say that and hearing you say what, what fulfills you and gives you energy, I think is very similar to what fulfills, you know, fitness and wellness professionals and, and gives us energy. So I want to, I want to move to a, a question that I think it would be good for you to address because I, I think I, I would love our, our audience to hear it from, you know, somebody like you, who's a physician that works with a broad spectrum of patients. Uh, you said to me when we were talking prior to the podcast that you had to confess that you've 
you've never really been to a health and fitness center. And, and I, I, I kind of smiled and laughed at that. And I, I think it's, it's actually great that you bring that perspective to our conversation. So talk to us a little bit about as a physician that works with the broad spectrum of patients from very young to very old, uh, people who have obesity and, and all those comorbid conditions. Talk to us about how you address the, the physical activity component uh, when you're somebody that isn't necessarily going to say, hey, go to, go to a health club because you don't yourself. And you said it earlier, if you're working three jobs, you don't have the time or the money to be able to afford that. So talk to us a little bit about your view on physical activity. Yeah, uh, yes, I confess that is true. Um, I did classic ballet for 10 years of my life, and I have doing like here and there yoga, which I like, but I will never go to a gym. Uh, I apologize for that, <laughs> but that's not, that doesn't fit me. Uh, doesn't make uh, the value of, of the gym or, or any exercise or sport uh, less important, right? And, and I want to clarify that. But the reality is that I have many patients like me and, and they need to exercise and I need to exercise. It's, it's important part of our life. So if you will not be able, I always say that the doctor is as good as the results. Doesn't matter how many diplomas, how many certificates, whatever. If you don't get good results, you are not a good doctor. That's part. Of, and that big part is how you convince your patient to do what he needs to do. And in your case, to do the exercise or diet or lifestyle modification that you need. So in my case, I rather to have this type of motivational interview where I find what is important for my patient, right? What, what will move their bodies, what will, uh, uh, you know, help them to, to, to feel like, okay, I can do this. Mm -hmm. and, and after that, it's, it's just to try to incorporate what is possible, right? Instead of doing an impossible plan that if you are lucky, will last a week and the end. Mm -hmm. uh, so for example, dancing, with your kids at home, playing soccer with your kids. Uh, uh, sometimes I tell my patients, you know, uh, YouTube and you are Latin and you like salsa, salsa with the husband and, or call a group of friends and go for a walk. Uh, not everything is, you know, perfect in life. We need to understand that. Uh, but as soon as you start getting these things incorporated, you will be surprised, but patients will like a little more and a little more. And when they start seeing the results, they will. So my suggestion for, you know, for you guys, and I want to say that the value that you guys bring to the table is enormous because, again, we are very tiny time with patients right now. And we don't have the power to create this long time or long term uh, modification. You have it. Right. So my suggestion is do what we are not able to do, not only because we don't know. Prescribing exercise is something that I learned when I did my obesity training. It's complex. Uh, it's more than go to the gym. <laughs> that, that doesn't qualify. Uh, but you have the knowledge and you have the power to be in contact with the patient and to create, the, in this case, it's your client, right, or the person for longer time and create a nice relationship, right, of trust, commitment, I would say even friend, mm -hmm. uh, friendship. You can find these areas that really motivate. And if you need to, you know, start with something that is not the typical and you need to ad adapt your routine, just to get that person engaged and in love with the plan, go for it. Yeah. I, I'm sure that you will be more successful long term. Yeah, absolutely. And it's just, again, it's great to hear that perspective because, you know, you, you work with people with a variety of different interests and lifestyles. And, and I think just broadening our perspective as professionals as to how we could move in a more enjoyable fashion, because I think that that's that is going to allow the program to last beyond that first week or two, as you talked about. And I would like to add, if, if you don't mind, I would like to add that there is a big problem, and I, I mentioned it before uh, in another context, but bias, discrimination. You need mm. to understand that that lady, especially young lady, 
that looks different than the common population that goes to the gym mm -hmm. will feel intimidated that that lady maybe lady or, or gentleman right a uh, girl or boy they may feel intimidated they may feel shame they may, may feel uh you know embarrassed they 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 have fear what you know what is everybody thinking about me how do i look i didn't find nice clothes uh, see how beautiful this girl looks so uh and that comes with a very big emotional component a lot of these individuals that are struggling with weight are struggling also with anxiety or depression and, and which one started first that's a very good question but they tend to coexist so it's very important for all of us to be kind to be respectful to use the correct words right uh, when we refer to people that has you know obesity they are not obese they have obesity right and which is different um and and to try to understand that there is a a very big bias against this group of people and that they need the emotional support as much as the exercise and the change of diet yeah thank you for mentioning that and you know i'll, I'll direct our audience back to I want to say it's episode 26 or 27 when we interviewed uh, Kirsten Sonneville from University of Michigan on weight stigma, which is exactly what you're talking about there. And it was uh, it was such a, a great conversation. So, yeah, such an amazingly important point. Uh, for for all of us to consider, not not just who are you know physicians and fitness professionals, but but everyone in society, because those biases definitely exist. Yeah, and we need to be kind. We need to be respectful, and we need to understand that uh, that many times these are medical conditions, right? This is the result of medical conditions. We need to stop judging people. Um, it's, it's, it's part of being a good a good citizen, right? Yes, yeah, yeah, part of being a good human. You got it. So be before I get to the last question, you know, we, we talked a lot about the concept of well-being and, and why it's so important for you know, caregivers in the helping professions in particular. If you could leave our audience with, with one thing to take away from this discussion on you know, well-being to be a better caregiver, what would you say that one thing would be? I will say... Use practical tools to help you to achieve well-being. And I say that because our altruistic, you know, part of the brain will keep us moving yeah. and, and, and will not allow us to go back to the self-care. Yeah. So we are in general in the medical field, right? In the wellness field, we are very disciplined. And, and if you have it in your calendar, it will happen. <laughs> so, so put it in your calendar, put self-care or gym or date with my husband or kissing my boys and having a time, you know, a special time with your boys. Make this and have it, and, and it takes a little, right, to, to really incorporate these things in your life. But if you don't have it as, as really time, time that you select to be used for your self-care, right, and your well-being, it will never happen. Uh, and that's reality. So, so it's not just I wish I will do or I will try my best is start doing practical things that will help you to be successful. Uh, because if not, it's just a, a wish. And my dad, my dad is 86 right now, uh, still working, by the way. He mm. did yoga almost all his life. And he was a, a yoga instructor, actually. Uh, my mom was in his class and my mom will be like jo joking and laughing all the time. And my dad will be like, hey. <laughs> uh, so you can see where I come from, right? I'm right. my mom's side, no, no, no exercising. <laughs> Uh, but uh, my dad always uh, reminds me, never use the term try, because when you, give, you use the term try, you are giving yourself the opportunity to bring excuses. I try, but, 
Mm. When you say, I will do it, stop excuses. There are not a space for those. You will do it. So I learned that from my dad decades ago, and, and I try to keep that in my mind and do it, not just try. Dad, Dad's advice is always right, for sure. My dad is amazing. <laughs> I love it. So I know you're early in, in the stages of writing this book. And so I, I'm sure hopefully when you get the book written and you know, we can have you back on, you could talk more about everything you learned. But for now, where can people go if they want to find out just more about some of the stuff you're doing? So, yes, I am relatively early, uh, which is not so early because if you count words, I already wrote four thousand words so oh, I have, <laughs> yes and, and uh, many chapters uh, I received the green light to to publish so this is reality now so I'm happy uh, the pre-sale of the book should be starting July okay. um, and the book will be ready for February next year oh. but if they want to follow me support me uh, learn a little more I am in LinkedIn and they can find me <laughs> as Miriam Silverglade or Dr. C uh, MD and, and I want to say something extra in some point in the next few weeks or couple of yes uh, probably a couple of months I will be recruiting people that may like to be beta readers so they will have access to the chapters of the book they will be able to read them and give comments so the the, the book can could be improved and adapt to the readers so I will be you know if someone is interested uh, to be part of the journey of how you write a, a, a book, uh, that will be a great opportunity to learn and to, to enjoy the, the journey and be part of my journey. Oh, that's great. Yeah. And we'll, so we'll link up to your LinkedIn profile on our show notes page so people can get in touch with you. And yes, Dr. Z, I found is a, is a much easier way to pronounce your, your, I know. your, your last <laughs> name. So uh, I, people will be able to find you on LinkedIn and we'll definitely you know, remind our listeners of that opportunity to be you know beta readers of the book. I think that's an awesome opportunity. So cool, right? I, I, yeah, I'm excited about that and hearing what everybody else has to say, because again, uh, this book is my collective journey with many others that are going through the same, many others that learn some lessons and, and those that want to change their lives with me. I love it. Well, Dr. Z, we're going to get to the last question of the podcast. And this <laughs> is this is my, my favorite question to ask medical professionals, because you guys have such a great perspective on this. And you know, I consider the wellness paradox, which is kind of the thesis behind this whole podcast to be this this gap in trust and interaction and communication between you know, fitness and wellness professionals and medical professionals. From your perspective, a, as, a, as a physician, what is one thing that the fitness professionals that are listening can do to close off that gap? Um, I, I will say that the gap is not so big as we think. I believe that what keep us close is the goal that we have and we want to serve we want to help uh, and we want to improve the quality of life of our patients clients uh, the people that we are working with so communication because the truth is that we are assuming that the gap exists but the fact that we are not communicating between each other, like we are doing today, uh, is actually generating this false idea. We are in the same boat, we have the same goals, we, we work with the same tools and we need each other to be successful. I need you guys because you have this knowledge that I don't have, you have this time that you can offer that I will not be able to offer and you need me because maybe your patient has medical conditions and need the medication so um i i don't want to see this paradox like a reality i want to see this paradox disappearing and all of us um working as a team i believe that's something that i learned in geriatrics and in life uh and that's part of the, the, the way that I am writing my book is 
uh, teamwork, right? A multidisciplinary team where you have people that have different ideas, different perspectives, different backgrounds, different abilities, and working together, they will be able to, to bring the, the best results. Awesome. <laughs> Dr. Z, thank you so much for joining us on The Wellness Paradox. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity. And I hope that this starts a, a relationship between the physicians and, you know, the wellness professionals. Uh, we are all in the same boat and we need to collaborate. And I'm here for anybody that, that may like to talk or share ideas. Um, just find me, LinkedIn, and I'll be there. <laughs> Well, I hope you enjoyed that conversation as much as I did. If you found it insightful and informative, please share with your friends and colleagues. Those shares make a massive difference for us. Any additional information we'd like to share with you can be found on the show notes page by going to wellnessparadoxpod.com forward slash episode five, six. Please be on the lookout for next week's episode when it drops on Wednesdays. And please take a moment to leave us a review on your favorite podcast platform. Until we chat again next week, please be well.